So, first of all, let's get started. Uh, I just wanted to make the point, and I think it's useful, I think this is a useful thing just very quickly to, to lay out before um, we, we start. I know that you've got um, other sessions that you're doing after this one. Is that sometimes uh, discussions in this area, especially education technology, the web, uh, conflate the idea of academia and learning. Now, I'm not going to pull this apart in detail, but it's useful to point out that it's the, the, the mechanism, the industry of academia, the, the idea of an academic career, what um, being academic re requires of you in terms of processes, in terms of language, in terms of your practice is quite, dis it can be quite distinct from the process of learning per se. And often um, when people level criticism or critique in a perfectly, you know, in a perfectly reasonable way, the web uh, in the context of higher education, they're actually critiquing it in the context of academia, not in the context of learning. And I see these things, obviously, you'd hope there'd be a big crossover, but I think sometimes these things are conflated. And that happens all the time in, in higher education, especially in institutions where perhaps the, you know, there's a lot of research as well as teaching and how those two things combine. So I, it's useful to sort of hold, it's useful to keep that in the, in the background. Now, in terms of the subject of today and, and, and um, you know, where Pi Day Live came from, uh, I, I went to BET, which is a big uh, sort of educational technology trade fair show thing, and they put on a little bit of a conferency aspect to it, and I was talking there. And for a reason that I still can't fathom, they'd invited the head of IT of Sainsbury's to come and give a talk. Um, I think it was because he was part of a large multinational company, not because he, you know, I couldn't understand what that had to do with teaching. Anyway, he pointed out that the biggest impact uh, on, uh, the, on, on shopping, effectively, in, in the last century was when they moved to self-service. And uh, thanks, Chris, for dropping that in there. And uh, it suddenly struck me that massively open online courses, um, so just in case you don't know what these are, these are these big online courses that are free to register. There's large platforms that are being run by um, major institutions in the US and uh, uh, there's one in the UK as well um, and you have tens of thousands of people potentially reg registering on courses but there's not that there's not that because of the scale of it there's not necessarily all that much interaction between the teaching staff and the students it's mainly done through videos quizzes and there will be discussion forums as well and it suddenly struck me that perhaps what we're moving into is an era of self-service education, that these massive open online courses are a form of self-service education. Um, and that you, you, know, you, you, walk, you walk onto the web and you wander around and you find the course that you want to do and you put it in your basket and then you pay for validation as you go through the tills. And that sort of, uh, that, you know, I, I was wondering whether higher education was becoming like the out-of-town supermarket from that point of view. And where, were, where was the teaching in there? And where was the, um, the idea of connecting with people? Okay, so I deliberately chose that image there, which is, is, is depopulated. Um, and I, I just wondered how that was going to work. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we... We are replacing one structure with another. The question is, um, what are those two structures really, and what 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 are we driving into? So, I think this is a really useful uh, way of looking at this. Okay, so this comes from uh, Dave Cormier's blog, and he's used this um, network idea that comes from Dave Snowden. And one of the interesting things about the massively open online course area is the fact that their heritage comes from the more, more connect, connectivist MOOCs, okay? So, uh, and again, I don't know how much you know about this, and because of this format, I, I can't kind of poll you for it, so I'm just going to go through it quickly. Um, so originally, perhaps from about um, 2007, 2008, um, 
the, the, there was a, a bunch of uh, Canadians, basically, who put on these connectivist MOOCs, which were essentially open courses, free to anybody who wanted to turn up. But they were very much about connecting people. They were very discursive. They were very visible online. So there would be an expectation that the participants would blog. The core teaching moments would be done in software not unlike this, but with everybody on mic, you know, chatting, chit-chatting with each other. So they, were, they had that kind of pedagogy around and that kind of connectivist, connected pedagogy. Whereas the X MOOCs that have, have, have grown up, as I say, because of the scale, you're not necessarily going to get any actual time face-to-face uh, -face or the equivalent face-to-face. -face. You're not going to have that communication with the key academic. That's going to be um, via videos, via quizzes, etc. And I think that um, Dave Cormier um, came up with uh, an interesting way of, of discussing this because one of the criticisms that was leveled at the C moots, at the connectivist moots, and uh, I think I think it's a fair criticism, is that you need a quite, you need quite a high level of skill to get involved with them. You need to have a reasonable level of skill in terms of computing, or not computing. Computing is the wrong phrase. In terms of those kind of internet skills, you know, your ability to get into a meeting room like this and perhaps you know be prepared to text chat, um, be prepared to get involved. You know, those discursive skills, those, that ability to frame your ideas, to frame your opinion. You need to have the kind of guts, if you like, at one level, to blog about the course, to perhaps critique what's happening, to move the knowledge forwards. So the, 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 the CMOOC format was very much about uh, students as, as producers, if you like. They were producing, pushing forward the knowledge, uh, very, as I say, very discursive. And so you, you had to be equipped with, with the educational, you know, with those kind of education related skills, plus those kind of online web skills to really get the best out of it, which was quite, made them, actually made them quite exclusive. And um, Dave Cormier um, wrote this post and said uh, that, you know, the, the thing about a, a connectivist MOOC was that it isn't a great way of necessarily learning something that is very focused and very structured. Okay. It's a good way of, um, of, of, of kind of building emergent knowledge together. And so he puts that into the, this complex category here, this idea of probe, sense, respond. And you can see how that would work if you're together and if you're discussing and if you're generating and if the students are part of that generating. Okay. Um, then the but whereas the X MOOCs um, and I, I believe that he wrote this post just on the cusp of when X MOOCs were, were coming about. He said that X MOOCs probably work better in in the simple quadrant here, or occasionally perhaps travelling towards that complicated quadrant. So the X MOOCs work, and I'm going to borrow a term from Dave here. You know where there is a correct answer where you're converging on a known and agreed correct answer. You're not, um, you're not debating or discussing. You're, you're, you're building up knowledge so that you have the, the ability to generate an answer that everybody agrees is correct. Okay, so that kind of structure and that works at scale. Now it's interesting that Herman said um, there that there's, there was no sense of belonging in, uh, in, in the MOOC because it was massive. Um, I, 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 I'm not sure if it's entirely because it's massive or it's because of the way that the pedagogy is structured, because of the way the interaction is structured. And that's the area that interests me. But certainly that idea of belonging is something that I want to come on to, that I will be coming on to, and, and how important that I think that is. Um, did you say what the axes were? I don't think that there are, they aren't really axes on this plane. They're just, it's just four areas, really. Um, so you could imagine you could plot a, a square or something. You could take your pedagogy of your course and say, well, it's kind of broadly in this quadrant, but it leaks over to these other ones. Um, so uh, I think that that's one of the key things that's intriguing to me is this idea of uh, that perhaps the pedagogical differences between subject areas that 
don't have a correct answer, but the pedagogy is in the discussion and subject areas where there is a correct answer that's agreed and you're working towards it. And this is why I, I you know, in my opinion, this is why the XMOOCs have grown out of a STEM um, science, technology, engineering, maths um, background. Uh, because in, in those subjects, at a certain level, there's, there's a, a lot of the pedagogy is about learning the mechanisms of getting an agreed answer, and therefore you can automate that. But we run uh, an online distance philosophy course out of my unit, and they, you know, that's run, hun I don't know, probably approaching 100 times, actually, and they still can't give me a yes or no answer on whether God exists. Okay, which, you know, so I don't know what these philosophers are up to. I don't know why they're always having this debate when they can't give me uh, a straight answer on that. Because obviously that's not the point, okay? Obviously there are plenty of disciplines where the point is not the answer that you arrive at. It's, it's the journey you take or it's the way that you construct a cogent argu argument, but not necessarily the result of that arg argument. Um, could practice be mapped against change? I'm not sure. That might be something you'd have to get on mic with. It's slightly too abstract for me at this point. Um, you mean, if you mean change in terms of the student's progression, then I think uh, that would be interesting, you know, where students start and where they finish. And uh, in the light of that, he said, delicately moulding that question towards what my next slide was anyway, so apologies if that's not what you meant. So one of the really interesting things uh, there to me is one of the criticisms levelled against uh, connectivist MOOCs was, hey, hang on a minute, these, these only work for people that are already really good at certain things, okay? If you're just hitting this area new, if, you, if, you don't, if you're not used to expressing yourself online, if you're not used to these kind of environments like uh, collaborate with at the moment, then it's going to be a massively uphill struggle. And they become elitist and you get a core group of people in the community and they're all having a great time and it becomes like a little niche club. I, I think one of the uh, criticisms you could level against the next MOOC is exactly the same but for different reasons. So this came out of a U Universities UK report that came out recently. Um, and it's I thought it was fascinating that this, this is Coursera. So Coursera is one of the, probably the biggest platform in terms of XMOOCs. And they survey their students. And this is the uh, highest level of education that the people who register on their courses um, have. Now, I believe it's people who register on their courses and not people who complete their courses. It wasn't entirely clear. But, um, the point here is that you can see that you've got a uh, bachelor's degree 42.8, master's 36.7, doctoral 5.4, associate, I'm not even sure what associate is actually, but I, you know, I suspect that that's um, higher than high school. And, and so there's the average level of education of people that are, I believe are registering for these MOOCs is enormously high. Now, I'd wager, I literally would wager money <laughs> that the, if the, the, the uh, breakdown, this statistical breakdown for the, for the, the, the participants that actually complete the X MOOC is even higher. And I'd, my guess would be that you know, the, the amount of people that have bachelors or above is over 90% in terms of people that actually finish. The reason being that because you don't have that teaching contact because you don't have that, that, that kind of old school teaching facilitation and guidance and, that, and the pastoral element to that, you need to actually have a lot of higher education type skills to get the best out of an X MOOC or even a C MOOC. You need to be equipped with those skills. So my question really, my question for you in the room, whether that's virtual or real, and I've just fallen into one of the traps that I hate, which is the idea that the virtual isn't real, don't get me started on that. Um, but my question is, what are we trying to achieve? Okay. So you could say that, that MOOCs have kind of driven e-learning, distance learning into the mainstream. Um, uh, and so they've become visible in that sense. But, but my question is, what do they mean pedagogically? 
are they just providing more stuff for people that are already good at learning to engage with, or are they teaching people, incoming students, how to learn? And immediately that poses the question, what do we think we're trying to achieve in higher education or in higher education as a whole? And that's a really interesting debate. You know, are we trying to teach people how to learn or are we trying to fill their heads with stuff? Okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, Herman, I'm, I'm on the creating more stuff side of things. Um, I mean, along these lines, I, I, and I don't want to be too negative about the concept of uh, the, the MOOC and the idea of open education. I think that's excellent, and I think that there are there are plenty of laudable things in there. And the idea of universities becoming more open, sort of breaking down some of those barriers, um, having non-traditional routes into the education, is great. But for example, those institutions that have signed up for MOOC platforms have they signed up as an extension of their academic strategy and their academic philosophy or not? All right. My way of considering that is to take the M off the front, get rid of the M, and uh, so that you've just got open online course, and then assess the value of it without the high numbers. So I just completely well, you 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 get what I mean, but I I completely uh, um, objectively say if these courses weren't massive why would we be interested in them? Okay, so yeah, it, so uh, it, it's that idea of dialogue and that idea of going deeper, which personally I think uh, higher education is all about. Now, I'm not saying, you know, I think that we've got, I think that we're in a good position here. I think that, that um, what's happening with uh, technology and learning, especially in this kind of massive MOOCy area, it will provide a platform for us to explore how we can how we can you know improve the pedagogy, but at the moment it feels like a step backwards. Okay. Um, so that's uh, the way that I um, define this in terms of the you know the practicality of the actual you know, the pragmatic way of looking at this is this idea of, of content or content, and it's the more you think about that. This, this sort of concept, the more um, subtle you realise it is. So, you, you know, at one end you've got the extreme, you know, one end of, of contact, you've got the idea of the face-to-face -face tutorial, that's kind of housing idea that you'd have, you know, one expert and eight willing students in a room together having a nice chat. Now, pedagogically that's, that's great, um, from a societal point of view, it's utterly elitist. There's no way it can't be, just because somebody's got to pay that expert gas bill. Um, I'd also argue that it's not teaching, um, and that uh, a lot of what goes on in the tutorial format isn't what we'd actually consider to be teaching. It's actually uh, an expert talking and uh, a bunch of students, you know, if, if once, once you get, once the student, the student tutor, I'll just try that again, once the student tutor ratio uh, becomes that low or high, but you know what I mean, then the concept, then the pedagogy required kind of falls away. But I don't mean that, in a, that that's not a negative thing. It's great if you've got that opportunity. At the other end of the spectrum, you've got the kind of, um, you know, seven PowerPoints in a virtual learning environment and, an, and a multi choice quiz and, and uh, accreditation at the end of it. Okay. Uh, so just content, effect, effectively, and no contact at all, and no opportunities for, for contact. Um, and I, I think that online distance learning can easily fall into that trap, as we know, in the sense that I think we're very good, and we've got very good at recreating um, curricular structures, um, the, the, the kind of flow of a piece of curriculum, a module, or what have you, online in terms of content, but I'm not sure how good we are at delivering contact uh, online, uh, and that's that's where the challenge is. So, um, in the, the I'm a co-PI on a project called Digital Visitors and Residents, and we've been interviewing. Uh, student or participants in America and in the UK, all the way from late stage high school, all the way up through four different educational stages we split them into, all the way up to 
um, staff or faculty, depending on which uh, country you're in. And um, we asked them a question. Now, if you had a magic wand, what would be your ideal way of learning? And some of them come up with this kind of answer. Okay, definitely just one of my teachers being able to appear. And if you think about it, that is that is kind of ideal. That's the more imaginative answer. Later on, I'll talk about the sort of less imaginative one, which is also interesting for different reasons. And um, that idea that you could go, wait a minute, I'm stuck on this, and the teacher would appear and you could have a chat with them. Okay, so that's that that is definitely a desire out there. Okay, now I'm just going to wind things back a little bit. I'm just going to um, so let me have a little look here. Yeah, okay, so that's interesting. I'll come back to that. Um, I'm just going to wind back. Okay, second life. Whoa, there's a, there's a blast. Okay, so there's there's me, or is it me? Well, let's not have a debate about that. Uh, floating in second life with some really weird looking trousers, actually. In fact, everything about that's weird. That's me floating on the Oxford Island, as was. Yeah, it's, it's pretty retro. Um, but the point about um, virtual learning, uh, virtual learning, um, virtual worlds like Second Life, is, and the thing that really struck me about them was the idea of presence. Now, the actual uh, mechanisms, the actual practicalities of virtual worlds make them very difficult places to teach in. But that sense of presence is very powerful, and people, the reason why people either love or hate those environments, these kind of environments where you have an, a 3D avatar, was to do with presence. So some people were kind of freaked out by that idea of presence, and some people loved it. And out of a project that we did around that years ago, we came up with this term, this is myself and Dave Cormier, of eventedness, okay? And um, this was the idea that if you went in something like Second Life and you had a teaching session and it went well, then you really felt like that you'd been somewhere with other people. It felt like it was an event, okay? So we came up with this, this sense that some things are more evented than others. Now, this is an interesting image, I think, because um, you have to ask, you know, wh where, where are those students? Are they in the physical room or are they online? And the ones that are online, who's connected to who? So which space are they actually in? Are they in the physical space or are they actually more present in an online space, despite the fact that they're in a physical room. But the point is that um, you know the face-to-face the -face lecture, although it's highly criticised um, from a pedagogical point of view, one of the massive advantages of it, and one of the massive advantages of physical institutions, is if you go to a physical lecture, even if it's not a great lecture pedagogically, you will have sat down next to somebody, they might be quite attractive, maybe not, perhaps that's not relevant, actually it probably is relevant, you'll have sat there with your fellow students in that cohort and you will have, it, it will engender a sense of belonging with that course, even if that sense of belonging is nothing to do with the actual curriculum. Do you see what I mean? So you come together, you sit in that room and think, oh I'm part of this, and then you go away again. And I think that that's um, I think that's incredibly important, and I, I still don't think we're very good at that online and through technology. Okay, so what we're doing at the moment is it is quite evented, um, but for me, I'm ploughing on and talking and just hoping that you're out there. And it's only when I see this text chat sort of notch up another chunk that I feel like, oh, you're still there. Um, but your experience of it might be slightly different. Uh, so. That's how I think about it. You know, how invented is, is what we're doing. And how can that idea, how can we bring in that idea of presence into some of these uh, uh, formats that are becoming mainstream out there, you know, in terms of technology and learning. So this was an insane chart that I came up with that was to do with inventedness. And I'm not going to go through it because it takes about half an hour to go through it. And um, uh, I don't know. I can't even remember what I was thinking when I made it, but my point is that the axes are quite useful. All right, what I plotted is a bit complicated, but that x-axis of isolation to belonging and the y-axis of individual to communal is an interesting way of thinking about what you're providing or what could be provided in terms of pedagogy. Okay, uh, and my point about virtual learning environments was that. 
they were a very high risk environment and that a good session, which would be at point B, felt very communal, highly invented, and you really felt a sense of belonging, a massive sense of belonging, much higher sense of belonging than any other environment that I'd been in on the web, any other sort of teaching and learning that I'd done at a distance. Now, the flip side of that was, if the, if the session went badly, you'd be down at A, <laughs> where, you just, where you, you, you just felt like you're on your own and you felt isolated. And what made the isolation worse was that you, you, you got the sense that there were other people somewhere else in the platform having a great time and you weren't part of it. You, know, you even get that in discussion forums, don't you? If you do an online distance course and you think, well, I wonder if there's another thread where the really cool people are having a great chat and whether I'm here on my own or not. So it's very easy to become isolated and I think that that's hugely demotivating and I, I, I think that part of learning is about that idea of belonging to a group of learners. Um, so this is... This, so this then links on to this idea of the visitor and, and the resident, and, and somebody's um, posted that there. Chris has posted it from a mobile. By the, I'm not sure why Chris T. Uh, presumably you put brackets mobile in your name, but I'm not sure what the relevance of that would be. Anyway, that's just me geeking out. Um, so. Uh, the, this is a continuum. The visitor and residence continuum is a continuum engagement. Again, I don't know whether you know about this or don't know about it. I'll go through this very quickly. But they're not two boxes, and they're not people. So there isn't a visitor or a resident. They are types of engagement based on context, and it's a sliding scale from one to the other. So if you approach the, the web with a visitor um, mindset, if you like, then it, you, you you sort of see the web um, like. Let me just go on to the actual slide that is more illustrative. Uh, you see the web like a kind of untidy toolbox, and, and you decide what you want to do. You rummage around, you open the lid, you go online, you rummage around for the tool you want to, to use, you use it, and then you put it back and you close the lid and you go offline, and you don't leave a trace, like a social trace. Okay? If you come to the web with a resident mindset, then you're thinking of the web, probably not explicitly, you're thinking of the web as a series of places or spaces where you've gone online to be with other people, to be present, okay? um, to be co-present. And you will have some form of digital identity, you will be expressing your opinion, you are, if you like, being yourself online. Uh, uh, so you'll, you, you'll probably have some kind of social media profile or something like that, or you might be commenting on blogs, but it'll have your name and your picture attached to it in some way. And when you log off, that, that presence might remain behind for a while. So like the images you post to Facebook, or even your tweets. Uh, they have a kind of um, presence half-life that erodes at different rates. So for example, a, a blog post has quite a long half-life before it sort of erodes, whereas a tweet maybe has a half-life of a few minutes unless somebody retweets it to kind of keep it alive. Okay, So that's the continuum. And that's a useful way of coming to an understanding of, of, of the kind of pedagogy we're providing and also the, the, the things that students are comfortable with in terms of the way that, that we engage. Now, my, my point is that you can't um, have that, I mean, if I just come back to that idea of content or contact, you can't, if we're talking about fully online distance, let's just talk about that for a moment, you can't have contact without presence. And if you're going to have presence, then you have to have a kind of resident, you have to be resident in some form, you have to be there online in some form. Okay. So this is a very blunt way of looking at it, but you could argue that the X MOOC is predominantly visitor um, mode, whereas the, the um, C MOOC requires you to be very resident. And as I mentioned, both of those are, require quite sophisticated skills, but of a very different flavor. Right? And you have to be clear, I think, about where you are in the pedagogy you're providing on this scale. Because in terms of setting student expectations and supporting them properly, you need to sort of know where you are so that you can provide the proper support and the proper structures. Now, um, 
what we do with the what we do with the visitor and, and resident uh, idea is we, we've got this, this mapping format where you can put a vertical axis on that where the top is personal and the bottom is institutional and then you can map your engagement with the digital environment so here's somebody's map it's not very clear I just wanted to show you that because some people's maps are very very um, <laughs> um, kind of detailed uh, so uh, yeah you, what you'll find is that most people when it comes to education, have a visitor mindset, even though, as, you, as, as, as Mark saying, we are social creatures. And that's the conundrum, and that's the really interesting area. The way I look at it is the web has broadened out our opportunities for different modes of engagement. So suddenly there's this huge palette of, of, of options in terms of modes of engagement. But generally speaking, we find that um, you know, students will be resident in the top right-hand quadrant, but do their education in the bottom left-hand quadrant. Now, that's partly because of the pedagogies we tend to provide, but it's also because that's what they think education is. Okay? Their expectation is that education is them, some content, and occasional contact with an expert. Right? But, it, but their expectation isn't that it's going to be particularly social. Right? Um, so that's quite, I'm not going to go into that map, but I just wanted to show you how detailed some people's are. Here's an interesting one here, and this is, this is a point that I wanted to bring up. So in this case, this person, and I've highlighted the, the, the sort of point that I want to, to bring up here. <clears throat> in this case, this person said, I'm very resident in, in Google Talk because I, that, I, I'm connected to my family and my friends, and it's on all the time. So it's always there and people can just grab me and talk to me. I'm less resident in Skype because I only switch it on when I have a meeting. Now my point is exactly that those technologies have pretty much identical functionality. But this person is managing their presence by using two different flavors of what is essentially the same technology. My point being that, you, that it, it's what it's important to consider people's modes of engagement, that's more important than necessarily asking them what technologies they use. If you just get a list of what technologies they use, you won't actually know what they're up to. Okay. Here's another one. It says all rights reserved, which I ignored because I think that they were being facetious. Uh, this is somebody who works at home. So you can see what they did was they did the normal map and then they suddenly thought, wait a minute, I'm, all over, I'm, I'm in Skype all the time. That's my major mode of being present professionally. And it's just on all the time and I spend half my work life on Skype. So they sort of put this huge Skype square over the top. So I think these are quite telling actually. Um, and here's another interesting one whereby somebody had somebody ran a, a club or a society, but they were also uh, an academic, and they they chose to map those two entirely different roles in their life in different colours, and they managed to separate those things out. For a lot of people, we find this convergence whereby. Um, uh, so, for example, I use myself as an example. Um, uh, I've only got one Google account. So in Google Docs, uh, in Google Drive, there's a mix of stuff. So what's happened is that my personal life and my professional life have kind of converged together in the middle. For a lot of people, we find that's what happens with Facebook. So that classic thing of their students friend them or their colleagues friend them, but they're also friends with their friends and their family. So when they go onto Facebook, they don't know which element of their life, whether it's personal or institutional, that they're going to be hitting. So I think that's... I, I think that's fascinating, actually. That de we're calling it decompartmentalization. You could call it convergence, it's a form of context collapse. And I think if we if we run um, if, if if we're interested in online pedagogies that are highly um, resident, uh, that are quite connectivist, if you like, then the people our students are going to end up with that conundrum themselves because that because their form of presence is going to be quite personal they might end up using a profile that they've only used personally and suddenly they're using it in an educational context so the edges of the, of, of the institution are becoming increasingly blurred and here's an example and that's an example of what I talk about so now I'm just going to get I want to get on so that's all in in a way that's that's kind of all background but I've got sort of um, 15 minutes or so just to, just to whiz through, well not to whiz, yeah, plenty of time, to talk about Oxford Connect uh, and, and that kind of thing. So to me, a, a helpful way of thinking about this is, is, is broadcast or conversation. 
So um, inst institutions and in some ways education, especially at scale, works on a broadcast mechanism. Um, so my question really was about um, how can we facilitate a conversation at scale, right? So this is a this is a kind of um, classic sort of statement here, is that students sometimes it's the case, it's not always the case. Uh, but certainly, if we're dealing with, say, non-STEM subjects, if we're dealing with subjects where there isn't always a correct answer, and I appreciate that in STEM subjects, it is, you know, it's not like there's always a correct answer in the STEM subjects as well, but I'm just simplifying it for the, for the, to, to make the point, really. So if we're teaching literature, philosophy, history, any number of social sciences, um, then uh, it's useful for the student. The students are obviously going to have to discuss things. They're going to have to present their work. They're going to have to argue for, for, for the point for their point of view that they're making. And we can't just have automated quiz style assessment throughout. We probably, if we're talking about a massive scale, we probably have to move to um, peer assessment. Now, you can't have peer assessment without some kind of presence, without some kind of resident mode because you need to know who the heck that other person is, okay? Because it's one person assessing another person's work. And that's only going to work if there's a certain amount of trust, if people feel like they belong. And so I think if we're going to make, if we're going to scale up some of the pedagogies that are probably reasonably close to our hearts, then we need to get with this idea of presence and with, the, and with these sort of resident modes of engagement. Um, so, so I'm just looking at the. Yeah, okay, good. I'm just checking that that, that um, there aren't any direct questions there. So this is where we come to the idea of Oxford Connect, which Chris was talking about. Um, it struck me. Uh, this was about about nine or ten months ago. I suddenly I, I was looking at the um, X MOOCs and thinking, you know, and this is obviously what I what I'm saying here is the problem to the really interesting problem for me is not um, putting a course on that 70, 80, 100,000 people can register on and go through in that automated big data kind of quiz machine kind of way. And I'm not saying people don't learn on those things, but the, the really interesting thing is how can we facilitate conversation at scale? Okay. How can we use the technology to try and um, give participants or students the sense that they're, uh, that they're connected, that they're present, that their voice counts, even when you're working with hundreds and hundreds of them? And this is a natural extension of the, the challenge that faces or, you know, most people in face-to-face -face teaching. You know, there's 200 people in a lecture theatre. Uh, how do you how do you make it worthwhile them actually turning up now? I, you know, how many how many teachers are actually thinking those terms? I don't know. One thing one thing that I, I do know with 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 learning increasingly moving online, everybody's going to have to um, account for their face to face methods. They're going to they're going to be reassessed and reevaluated. Okay, so yeah, have we got a Dunbar number there? Is that 150 in there? I've actually, I actually um, submitted a project to the to a research council with Robin Dunbar once, and we didn't get funded, which was disappointing. But looking back, it would have been a terrifying project to do. Um, Mark, is that is that what you're talking about? I won't follow the link. It's just in, intriguing. Yes. That, so the, the the theory there is that it's impossible for us to really know in any meaningful way more than about 150 people. Yes. Thanks, Mark. Uh, and that comes from studies that come from from uh, primates, higher order primates, and and language and etc. The actual numbers are around about eighty. Um, so in in that case, how how if that's the case that as that, that as human beings we can only actually cope with really knowing and connecting with around about eighty to one hundred and fifty people. One hundred fifty is the maximum. Eighty to that. Uh, if that's the case, then how can you actually scale that up? And I think it's a really interesting challenge. Okay, so the idea with Oxford Connect with Pi Day was was to see if we could how engaging could we make a massive event. 
And uh, we're working with Marcus de Sotoy, which was handy because he's an engaging guy and obviously he's good in front of a camera. And so what we did, we, 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 um, we came up with a format whereby th there was a job to be done by the participants. So we asked them to derive pi using a, a variety of um, ancient methods, effectively. So the main one was throwing matches or pins onto a, a piece of paper with lines on it. And then you can add up how many times a pin crosses a line or is in between lines. Do a very simple bit of maths. And that will derive pi to a certain extent. Or you could cluster marbles together. Or you could just measure around a dish. And there was another one where you could do something with rivers that was utterly impossible. So, but we did say it was impossible, but it didn't mean we didn't want people to try. So the idea here was to, you know, the question I asked myself is, what was the point of turning up live? Okay, why would you turn up live and then essentially sit watching a video that might as well have been pre-recorded on YouTube? This is one of the reasons why I'm keen for people to text chat, because otherwise I might as well have been pre-recorded. Do you see what I mean? So if it's going to be live, let's make sure there's a reason for it to be live. And the main thrust of that reason was that we were going to ask them to do that derivation of pi and then give us the data and then we'd respond to how that data was coming in all within the space of 45 minutes. So I call it closing the loop, if you like. So what you've done there is, you, is you've introduced the topic, you've got your participants to do something, you've gathered data from them and then you've responded to them all in one chunk. Okay, so there is a reason for turning up live. You can go to the, you can go to the Oxford Connect webpage <clears throat> now and, and watch the video back. You can do the experiment. You can even put your results in now. But it's not quite the same as doing it on the day. And what we did was we crowdsourced their results, and you can see the result there. What we also did was we found that um, the uh, our website. Um, just we were not prepared with the amount of people that turned up, which was somewhere, I don't know, it was over 2,000 people, it's difficult to tell. So our website went very slowly. Fortunately, um, uh, uh, the, 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 the video feed of Marcus Live didn't stop, but the reason I think that we only got 300 results instead of maybe 1,000 is because the website went so slowly. Uh, but 300 results was quite, was quite good. I mean, it was genuine. It's a really, you know, anybody who's taken the time to submit a result must have been really engaged. And so NetSkill is really helpful. This is what Chris was talking about, because we've been this out via Collaborate, and we also beamed it out via um, YouTube Hangouts. And in the middle of the Collaborate session, you could, um, people were split into subgroups so that they could have a chat with uh, a math student from Oxford. So the idea was to make it as discursive as possible. I think in the event, because everybody was having fun deriving pi, there was probably less chat than I would have liked. Because in a way, we were asking them to do too much stuff, because we were asking them to derive pi and asking them to ask questions, et cetera, et cetera. The place where we really found a high level of engagement, and this is what I was pleased about, was this was very evented. It really felt like a really exciting live thing that you were part of. It was happening now. You were really there as it happened, when it happened. And, and the, it, the, the live event is, is, is extremely compelling. And if you think about, say, Twitter, an awful lot of Twitter activity is in response to live events. So even though you know, the web is always on, always there, and constantly flowing. It's actually these, 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 these live events, and pedagogically, they create like milestones within a kind of learning design, like hubs. So you work up to them. I call it the field trip. So you like work up to these live events. You do the live event. They're quite chaotic, but they're very evented, and you feel like you belong, hopefully. And then you come away and you reflect on them. And I think that that's a, that's, that's a fun pedagogy. So really, what we were doing in Pi Day was not dissimilar to what you'd have done in a secondary school classroom if you were face to face. But we were doing it online, live, and with 2,000 people. And the 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 thing that really surprised me um, was yeah, just how what a buzz there was around it. And after we finished, Marcus had a look at his Twitter stream, and he just had like tens and tens and tens of, of tweets from, from kids in classrooms saying, hey, shout out for us. You know, we're, we're doing, what, my favorite one was, we're supposed to be doing English, but we're doing maths instead, okay, which seems like a win to me. And we got like really exciting pictures tweeted to us of 
of classrooms with all kids gathered around a big screen and there was Marcus on the big screen and it was kind of our thing up on the big screen. And it went from being this abstract idea to me feeling, actually, we're really connecting. We're really connecting with a whole load of people. We had, I can't remember how many schools, we had people from 17 different countries. Um, and, and, you know, so that kind of chaotic live event aspect of it, the inventedness, the presence really worked. I think another thing that we do next time is we unashamedly have a shout out section in the middle. Because it would only take about 60 seconds. Yeah, uh, whereby we, we we keep a closer eye on Twitter and we just have a list of hey there, hey you, you know, uh, you know, in that sort of Saturday morning TV kind of a way. Because although it's frivolous, that that's where the sense of belonging comes from. That's where that cohesion comes from. And I think if you can really push that, then people are going to be motivated to learn. Okay, and I'm sure that there were plenty of people that did learn, and, and a lot of school teachers will have picked up on this. And next skills were really, really helpful because I knew that I was in safe hands there in terms of the, the people that were in Collaborate. Um, while <laughs> while uh, the guy that was vision mixing for me had to rush through to the other room to figure out why his server had fallen over, it was exceptionally stressful, but kind of fun. Okay, it was it was a real it was a real kind of adrenaline ride in terms of running it. Um, so that's what that was about. We're hoping to do some more. I'm asking the university for some funding to do some more, and I think that they'll give it to me. And the idea is, to, is as I say, conversation at a scale. Now, relative to what I was saying earlier, I, I think that I'd, I'd put that into, you know, I, I could see having these kind of events in of itself. You know, the principle of what we've done here is not necessarily technologically radical, but I think the way that we've brought it together and the moment in time that we've done it works quite well. So you didn't necessarily need to be super high tech to get to get into it. Okay. And you know, for example, that graphing is Google graphing. So my developer could put that together in, in a day instead of having to invent something from scratch. So we're definitely sort of bringing stuff together from around the web, grabbing the breath best of the free stuff that we that we that we could. Uh, and um, Google Hangouts on Air was good as well. So that YouTube video is literally just Google Hangouts on air. Well, I think I might have edited a logo onto it afterwards, but I didn't need to because as soon as you finish the Google Hangout on air, it just wraps it up, sticks it out there online. Okay, so you've immediately got your, your kind of artifact out of the event. Um, so you've got this sort of multi channel engagement, really. Um, and as, as I say, we could have focused on Twitter a little bit more, but it was actually, they were actually hitting Marcus because he's kind of like the famous person. I, I don't think, I mean, you've got the Oxford thing, you've got the Marcus thing, and I'm sure that that drove some of the numbers, but in terms of the pedagogy, this could work with 50 people, it could work with 100 people. It doesn't have to be 2,000 people for this to work. Um, I'm not necessarily, I'm more interested in the conversation than I am in the massive, I suppose. So, uh, that's what we did. Now, FutureLearn is, is the kind of OU's platform, uh, or at least it's related to the OU, but it's a separate business. Um, and what's interesting is just a couple of weeks ago, uh, I, I stumbled across the format that they use, the kind of, pedag the kind of learning design structure for their courses. And every, the courses are going to be like six weeks long. This is probably confidential. I don't know. We're not part of FutureLearn, so if that stuff leaked, then I can tell you about it. Um, six weeks long. But they, at the moment, they're saying we're going to include two live events. And, and I thought, oh, well, that, well, that's interesting, isn't it? I think that that's laudable. But actually running those events is, is, is quite an, it, it's quite an interesting kind of, it's a new set of skills really to be able to get the balance right between them. Twitter, shout outs, the core of the curriculum, getting the video running, making sure that you, you know, everybody's happy and they're chatting and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I, I'm wondering whether you know, the best of the MOOCs will start to develop these kind of live events. It's a tough thing because the world is a sphere, and so you know, anything that's live, as we know, you're disenfranchising half the planet unless they're prepared to get up really early. Fortunately, Pi Day was run on the 14th of March, so 3.14 if you're American, at 1.59 p.m., 3.14159. Um, and um, because it was at 1.59 p.m., we caught, we caught the whole of Europe, uh, and also we got the, um, 
east coast of America as well. So there are times of days that you can run synchronous things that are more helpful than not. Okay, I've got uh, a couple more um, uh, minutes uh, to uh, just go through a couple more things there. And I think that this is something that perhaps relates more to your personal practice than these, these larger ideas, but it's definitely something that's useful to consider. So I couldn't find a really good image for the idea of disintermediation. So I tried to do something clever typographically, but it just doesn't look right. But anyway, um, here's the interesting thing about Oscar Connect. Okay, I was reasonably careful about letting the, you know, my boss and uh, and eventually the, the pro vice chancellor knowing that it was the, that it was happening. But ultimately, I had pretty much everything to hand in front of me because the web was right in front of me. I could design a logo, I could start up a Twitter stream, I could get the Facebook page, I could grab the Google Hangout. That working with NetSkills is slightly different because it's an institutional partnership. But my point is that um, I didn't need to spend a huge amount of budget. There was staff time and I did have some budget for that and that was agreed. But I didn't need to buy big bits of equipment, I didn't need to fill in great big forms to get a Twitter feed etc, etc. I just made sure that I alerted the people that needed to know so it didn't come as a surprise to them and just got on with it with my, with, and, and I was working with three, three other key people in my group. One was the developer who was putting together the, the graphing and the web page. One was a guy who's really good at video. And another was a, a woman, Sarah, who's very good at social media engagement, sort of producing these things. So a little team of us didn't take us very long considering the impact it had. And that was mainly because the web is disintermediating the kind of classic institutional mechanisms. Okay, If I'd had to do this by officially um, without the web and, and I'd had to you know find a TV studio or I'd had to have got you know, bought a streaming media server, or et cetera, et cetera. There's just no way it would have happened. So that's, that's my point, is there's a massive opportunity in terms of practice here, because the web just allows you to get on with things. I think Martin Weller uh, wrote a post like zero cost research, if you like. There are plenty of things that you can just get on with if you're, if you're sort of slightly cunning about it. So Pi Day, so Oxford Connected Pi Day Live was an official thing, it was all agreed, but my actual ability to get on with it was certainly smoothed by the, the fact that I, uh, that it was using available technology that was out there online. Another example of this is my visitor and residence um, uh, sort of idea. I was asked to give a talk about, you know, how I'd come about that and that sort of heritage of that last year. So, and I, and I started to search for visitor and residence to see where it had travelled to. And then I realised, oh, what if I search in other languages? So I typed this for resident into Google Translate, took the language, the, the translation that, I, that it gave me, whether that was Finnish, Swedish, German, French, what have you, put that into Google and all sorts of things appeared. And that's just this montage slide of that. But my point is, again, in terms of disintermediation and my own practice in terms of, of, of research is that um, I, I, there's one paper that I co-wrote with somebody that's in an open access journal. The rest of this idea is entirely blogs, tweets, videos, talks like this. It's com completely non-traditional in terms of gaining traction. Uh, and it's not dissimilar to Oxford Connect from the point of view that you can just get on with this. Um, so yeah, I think that probably is the, is, is the post. I think, and I think it's a very, very healthy um, mindset that, that Martin's proposing there. Now, I, I appreciate that not everybody's in a role that they can do that, um, but I, I think that it's, it's just an interesting way of looking at it. And disintermediation has uh, um, an interesting effect in some ways. So I did this little experiment where I went through the people that follow me, and about every fifth person had something in their profile that said, these are not the views of my employers, these views are my own, these views are not the, the uh, uh, are, you know, uh, are, are, what's this one in here that's quite full on? Views expressed do not reflect past or present employers, okay? Uh, and the point is that something like Twitter, again, has disintermediated the um, institution. So you can have a voice, you can go straight to your audience, if you like, you can go straight to your community. Uh, 
but it creates this tension between, well, who are you? Are you a person or are you your job? So if you remember that personal institutional axis on the visitor and residence kind of grid and mapping, as, uh, as your practice evolves, that axis collapses online and you end up with this really interesting tension whereby most of these people, most of what they tweet about is work. But they feel they have to say that even though they're tweeting about work, it's not the view of their institution. I mean, what is an institution if it isn't the people who work there? So I'm just sort of throwing that out there. I think that that's, I think we're in a very interesting moment in time from that point of view. Now, just lastly, I just want to throw one last idea at you and then I'll stop. Okay, and I want to come right back to pedagogy and I want to come back to, you know, perhaps slightly um, more, it's almost ideological effect of the web. Okay, so here's a quote that one of our uh, research participants got from his tutor. He said, well, hang on a minute, what do you think, you know, why have you got a problem with Wikipedia? Because we find a lot of academics have problems, especially school teachers will say, don't use Wikipedia by which they mean, don't tell me you've used Wikipedia. Uh, and he said this, okay, you don't actually learn anything, you just get an answer. That's what the technology is selling, okay? So this is just a final point that I want to throw out there because I think it's an interesting point for discussion, okay? So Google's strapline, my suggested strapline for Google is think less, find more. I, they haven't taken me up on that for whatever reason. I think I tweeted it at them once. Um, <laughs> um, now, I don't think that they're, uh, you know, this idea of whether Google's evil or not. I think they're just trying to be as efficient and as helpful as possible. But ultimately, this is what they're selling. And if you think about products like Google Now, which I won't, I won't explain what it is, but take a look at it, it's basically trying to provide you an answer to a question that you haven't yet asked because it's tracking patterns in your life, okay? So my, my uh, version of Google Now tells me how long it's going to take me to drive home 10 minutes before I set off because it knows that I've got a reason, you know, fairly predictable pattern to the way that I move around. It's worked out my, where my work is, it's worked out where my home is, okay? Uh, if, if it had access to my finances, it could probably work out when I need to fill the car with diesel, All right? So, we're in an environment, and just to equate this back to X MOOCs as well, um, we're in an environment whereby this is what's being sold to students by the technology. So this is the alternative answer to that magic one question. This comes from a different student. Okay. And I'm going to read it out because we're, we're, we're at the end here. Perfect thing, I think it would be that all the useful, ac accurate, reliable information would like glow a different color or something so I could tell without wasting my time without going through all of them. That's what the student hopes Google ought to be if it worked perfectly. Okay. But I could tell without wasting my time without going through all of them. That process of going through all of them is what most of us would consider education research is. So there's a really interesting tension there. And it's possibly not helped by this kind of move to a more consumerist model in higher education. So I, I, I just wanted to put that out there just to finish up with, to come right back to where I think that the technology is really affecting the pedagogy. So the, the, the main things that I've, that I've gone through are this, this idea of content or contact, conversation, you know, broadcast or conversation. The Oxford Connect is, is certainly my first stab at conversation at scale, but there are limits, and that Dunbar number thing is, is intriguing to think about. And then ultimately, we have to ask, what are the expectations of our students when it comes to technology? Uh, you know, the, the idea of contact, the idea of presence, the idea of discourse is quite sophisticated. It's the kind of thing you come later to in your educational career. It's messy. It's, it's slightly chaotic, okay? Um, so if we go back to um, the, that network that Dave Cormier was using, it, it's kind of it, it probe, sense, respond. Probe, sense, respond is what he thought CMOOCs were good for. Now, probe, sense, respond is a long way from, is this going to be in the exam, right? Um, 
So I'm going to I'm going to stop there on the concepts just to let you know that there's plenty going on with you know bits of resonance type type of stuff. Um, we're putting together a, a course with with, with net skills. Um, so hopefully we'll be piloting that in the autumn. That's exploring some of the challenge challenges of resident forms of of, of, of practice practice. Not because residency is necessarily better than a, a visitor mode, but just because it's, it's less known. It's an area we're developing practice in. Um, and there are a few other things going on as well. With Oxford Connect, you know, watch this space. Uh, we'll be putting on some more events, I hope. It will take a while to get that up and running, but they will be free, they will be open, so that you can come on those, whether you're directly interested in the subject or whether you're just intrigued to see how that format works. And whatever happens, there will be a reason for you to turn up live. There will be, it will be an event, and there will be a reason for it. It won't just be something that ought to be a recording. So um, I'm going to stop there and open it to questions. And Chris, I don't know how best, if you, I think you're going to sort of wrangle questions. Is that right? Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Dave. That was fantastic. Um, yeah, I think what we'll do for questions is, um, obviously, if you've got a question that you can put into the chat window. Um, can you hear me, by the way, Dave? Am I coming through on the mic? Yeah, and I realise I've mistimed this because originally it was 10 to 11 and I put that in my brain, so I really apologise. I would have gone faster. I was aiming for court <laughs> to and I shouldn't have been. Apologies. No worries. Well, I think it would be useful to, to get some questions uh, from the group okay. anyway. Um, so, yeah, if you've got a text question, you want to put it in the chat window, put a queue before it. Um, but if you have got a slightly more nuanced question and you want to address it um, to Dave by voice, I will pass you my lovely, comfortable headset which should um, extend to, to wherever you're sitting. So just stick your hand up in an analog sense. So oh. Sue's asked a question there. Do we need to promote the use of text to collaboratively and individually process knowledge, text, audio, or video? And uh, Sue, I'm going to need a little bit more. When you say to promote the use of tech, do we need to promote the use of tech? Um, Sue's not actually in the room. She's she's joining. No, I know, I know she's not. But I'm I'm asking. I'm going to ask her to elaborate in text okay. if she's still there. Two other educators. Right. Okay. Um, I think what's going to happen there too is that education ed educators are going to be increasingly required to use technology. Certainly higher higher education. I, I think if you're in a classroom situation, it's it's very different because your practice can doesn't have to use technology in quite the same way. So they're literally in front of you. I think in higher education, it's just expensive. Floor space is expensive. It's expensive for the students to, to move to a new city. I think that, that that education is going to be increasingly online. And I make the case that face-to-face -face courses are increasingly online. So just because you're living a kilometer away from your lecture theatre doesn't mean that most of your course won't be online. So yes, I think what we need to do is promote is it, 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 it to promote good, interesting forms of practice, not to say good practice. But in terms of the use of these things, um, education are going to sort of be forced into it. I mean, I, I, I know for a fact that there, that there will be people around the country that have been forced to make a course for, for, for FutureLearn, for example, and so they're just going to have to figure it out. So I, I, I think what we need to be doing is having discussions that talk about practice in the context of technology. And I think that the trap that we fall into is we is that we tend to talk about how to use this bit of technology, how to use that bit of technology, which is fine, but we don't have a discussion before that, which is what the heck are we trying to achieve and how can we achieve it best? Okay, in that area, this technology will help you to do that. I think that that his, because as an effect of history, and also sometimes it's it's to do with the way institutions are set up. Um, we 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 tend to teach technology rather than teach new forms of practice. Okay, I know that you know it's a bit chicken and egg, but there we are. Do we need to differentiate subjects and uh, and knowledge structures? I, again, I, I, it's difficult for me to totally get into that question. Um, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we chose Pi. Well, that was Marx's idea. Um, and one of the reasons we chose it is because there is an international Pi Day. So that, that made it sort of intrinsically an event 
because it happened at that particular moment in time. And yes, there are some things that are, there are some subject areas or areas of subjects which are more appropriate for that sort of conversation discourse, that kind of, of mode of engagement. So for example, and especially if you're asking people to do, to do an experiment or to submit data. So uh, it depends who your audience is. If it's a total public engagement thing, then the, the, the level you pitch for is normally kind of GCSE level. And then you sort of, everybody can cope with that. I split it down into three main audiences. There's, there's the, the, the expert, which would be like researchers talking to researchers. There's the discipline aware. So that's people who would perhaps read that section of the newspaper or perhaps um, subscribe to something like New Scientist or Nature or something like that. Uh, and then there's the sort of general public who have a passing interest in the area. And it depends what audience you try to attract. I think one of the problems of working at scale is that we don't define the audience. We just say, hey, anybody can turn up, which makes it very difficult to design the learning. And what I'm going to do with Oxford Connect is I'm going to, I'm hoping to do some events whereby I actually define the audience and say, if you want to turn up to this event, you need to be comfortable with having read, you know, you need to be able to read an article in Nature and get your head around it. How exactly I'm going to do that anyway, I don't know. And there are areas, yeah, there are areas that work better than others. Interestingly, I'm predominantly going by the skills of the academics involved. So you have to be able to be engaging and to be able to talk into a little camera like this um, without sort of finding that disturbing. So for me, it actually goes um, um, teaching and learning communication skills of the individual, then uh, discipline and then specific focus in that discipline. But I'd argue that most curriculums would have at least two or three concepts or activities within them that could be handled in this way. Thanks, Dave. I was wondering whether, because we um, we're slightly behind time, if there's one more question perhaps that we've got for Dave, then we can... Uh, all right, hang on. I'm just going to hand the mic over to... This is Dave Bramley. Um, here he is. Hi, that feels rather strange putting the headphones on, but uh, yeah, but, um, <laughs> I was thinking back to the slide about the attendees at MOOCs, and okay, yeah, I wasn't really that surprised to see there were people with higher level skills, and you could consider they could have been developed by Harvard and MIT, and they're on things like Harvard. Yeah, sorry, I'm trying to be helpful by going back to it, but what I did was yeah. just use up all the bandwidth. Can you say the last bit again? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, I say that, that um, courses designed by Harvard and MIT on artificial intelligence are not necessarily going to attract the man on the street. So it's not surprising that it's people at a higher level um, learning. Yeah, that's a good that point. Taking part. Yeah. Uh, but what I was thinking at the same time was is that um, they um, may not be that IT savvy, and they. Okay, I've lost. I've lost you there. Yeah. Sorry, they may, they may go away and try that delivery method right. um, themselves. Um, yeah. What I was thinking about, about the course, um, have you done any follow-up to see if any of the people who attended the Pi event have tried to develop something similar? Yeah, no, we haven't, is the simple answer to that question. Um, it's one of the... One of the difficult balances to strike is that idea of openness. And so we didn't hit our, um, we didn't ask people for very much information about themselves because we wanted to make it, the easiest way to engage with the event was literally just to hit that URL during it and you could just get on with it. We did have a follow-up survey, which obviously hardly anybody filled in. And so we don't know a lot about what people have taken away. Um, in terms of that sort of format of event. I would imagine that not very many people have tried it because a lot of the participants were schools and so they have that immediate face-to-face, -face, so there's no need for them to do that. Um, just going back to your point about, about the profile of these students, yeah, you're absolutely right and that must be a big influence on it because uh, you're, you're, you're unlikely to turn up something on artificial intelligence unless you're fairly H-E attuned. I think I'd still make the case that to get the best out of that kind of pedagogy, you still, you'd still have to, you know, I, it, 
what you're saying is right, um, but I still think that the pedagogy requires a high level of skills as well. Yeah, and and and, and Sarah, this it, it, this is this is all about digital literacy in some senses, but I but I I'd make the case that um, digital literacy in terms of your ability to be resident, your ability to engage with online events, your ability to get into discourse, to express yourself, to develop a voice, to feel like you belong, are the literacies that are, are more challenging, and more interesting for us to try and tackle than using a spreadsheet, using Word, etc. So, yeah, no, that's a good point. Thanks for that. I can't remember. I can't remember who was talking just then, but that's a really good point. Um, that there's a kind of natural um, skewing of the people that are coming on those courses. Yeah, but that's a potential advantages because those people can learn to develop those skills by taking yeah. part in the course. And that's what I was thinking about your Pi one. Yeah. Pi. That wasn't the point of it. it to say that last. Uh, say that last sentence again. I lost it. Hang on. I'm sorry. It, it, I say you didn't run the the session about Pi so that people could learn about Pi. You were actually demonstrating a different method of delivery. And I just wondered if you've done actually any follow up to see if any what people had learned through the method of delivery. Yeah, uh, it, it, that's a good point. Um, yeah, it was an experimentation in a method of delivery, and we chose a subject that we knew that would be most acceptable and most interesting to the broadest range of people. Um, I, we did do a little bit of follow-up, so we asked people, you know, did you feel like you actually learnt anything? And most people said that they did. Um, it's worth remembering that even that, that even Pi, if you're, you know, 14, elements of that are new. So for for a lot of the people that attended, I think that they were actually learning about Pi. But you're right, that wasn't my motivation. Um, and the talk that Marcus gave. Um, was quite sophisticated in places, so we were playing that really fine line of making sure that it wasn't going to be too exclusive, so there was no barrier to entry, but that it wasn't going to be too dumbed down either. So although the activities that themselves were really straightforward, the, 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 what, what we spoke about was much more complicated. And right in the middle, Marcus did some maths that I, I certainly couldn't get my head around. Um, but um, so. That's one of the reasons why I'm keen to move into that kind of discipline aware audience and to see if we can use that mode of delivery at a level whereby we're really connecting people with research that's emerging out of Oxford because that would be the real challenge because in terms of impact and the ref and all the rest of it, that one of the criteria is um, connecting your research, you know, communicating your research outputs to a more diverse audience. So can that be done using that delivery mechanism, or will that delivery mechanism always be a little bit Saturday morning TV? So that's the next fun bit. <laughs>